Greetings everyone, I am Dr. J, and welcome to my review of Hades. This is a game I've been keeping a casual eye on for a while now, as it's a game by Supergiant, one of the indie darlings from when the independent game scene was picking up steam in the early 2010s. Back then, they stood out with Bastion, a game with solid gameplay, a compelling art style, great music, and most importantly of all, the voice. Proper story is supposed to start at the beginning. Ain't so simple with this one. Now here's a kid whose whole world got all twisted, leaving him stranded on a rock in the sky. Since then, their other games have followed suit, though I'll admit that Transistor and Pyre didn't grab me in the same way. They weren't bad games by any means, but the gameplay wasn't as appealing to me, to where my time with Transistor is a bit of a blur now, and Pyre, after an hour of playtime, has been sitting on my backlog for a couple of years now. To cause even further worry, when Hades was announced, it was for early access as an Epic Game Store exclusive. And if you aren't aware of why that's a bad thing, the Epic Game Store has been an utter mess from a consumer standpoint, whether it be a lack of important features, the accusations of spying on Steam data that isn't even accessible from the usual APIs, and the fact that they weren't competing with Steam by making a better service, like what you see from GOG or the Xbox Game Pass, but instead saying, hey, you know that cool game you're looking forward to that you've put on your Steam wishlist? Well, if you want it, you'll have to go through us for the first year. So here's a storefront you'll have to deal with, which somehow has less features than Origin did on launch. How very considerate of you. That all being said, why did I decide to pick this up given my personal investment wasn't necessarily there? Well, in the case of Hades, it was the first game announced as an Epic Game Store exclusive. And even then, it was for the early access version of the game. So I don't think they could have reasonably known how bad the store would end up being on release, and as such, I'm willing to extend the benefit of the doubt. Just don't expect this to be a trend. With my backlog, I can afford to be picky with what I buy and review. Second, it was sold as an isometric brawler with roguelike elements, which seemed like it would be right up my alley. A refined version of Bastion's combat with the procedural generation and merciless difficulty of a roguelike? Don't mind if I do. So with this potential for it to be good, I stepped in, decided to stream my first impressions of it, and then spent the next three hours ignoring things like food and sleep in favor of defeating that stupid Hydra that killed me when it only had a sliver of health left. God damn it, you are going to pay for that, you bony son of a- For this game, you take on the role of Zagreus, the son of Hades, who has grown weary of living his life out in the underworld and has chosen to leave. However, because this wouldn't be a story based on Greek mythology without an overdose of family drama, Zagreus and Hades don't exactly see eye to eye. So instead of letting him out, Hades decides to let him exhaust himself in attempting the journey over and over, with the wretches of the underworld forcing him back each and every time. Be that as it may, Zagreus is not to embark on this journey alone, as the gods on Mount Olympus have taken notice of his existence courtesy of a tip from Nyx, the goddess of night, and are eager to assist him in making the journey out of the underworld. Thus, the stage is set for a roguelike game that's surprisingly effective from a story perspective, as with everything taking place in the underworld, you can't technically die so much as be thrown back home. And you would think the premise would grow stale after a while, but then you start to notice the attention to detail that went into every encounter and every permutation. Throughout the game's runtime, there's never a line out of place, and while there might be similar sentiment, there's always a slightly different permutation to where it took me 10 hours to find a repeated line, and even as I'm recording this review, I'm still finding new ones. Sometimes the gods you're receiving a blessing from will notice that you received a blessing from another god, and will make a comment on them and their influence on you. Sometimes you'll be forced to choose which blessing to receive which leads to a more difficult encounter where the other god is directly interfering with you with special dialogue when you either succeed or fail. I warn you not to trifle with me, nephew. Sometimes you'll get the blessing from a shop run by Karen, the one who ferries the dead across the river Styx, which might seem odd at first, but doesn't go unnoticed by the god you're receiving the boon from. Every time you're forced back to the starting point, different characters will show up or be in unique locations based on events that occur outside of your limited view, which makes the world feel so, for lack of a better phrase, alive and lived in. And that's before mentioning that the story itself is really fascinating. I honestly didn't expect it to be all that much to write home about, just a simple premise that's executed well, and yet it managed to fit into the structure of a modern roguelite really well. Even outside of the main story, the characters you interact with all have their own goals and interests, which you're able to learn more about and somewhat influence as you work on your own objective. It creates a bit of intrigue as you go through the house and learn more about them, to where even if you're having trouble moving the main thread along, there's always something more to explore along the way. 
To reinforce this, the information is doled out in bits and pieces, giving you plenty of time to speculate as you make your way through the underworld. Furthermore, to say everything and nothing, the story doesn't end when you make it through the final fight, which ensures that you'll be trying out everything the game has to offer. In fact, it's surprising how effectively the story maintains the gameplay conceit without ever growing repetitive or overstaying its welcome, as even when circumstances change, it's done in a way that makes logical sense, without getting in the way of gameplay. It would have been easy to let a bit of ludonarrative dissonance crop up, but somehow they managed to avoid it through the game's entire runtime, which given the genre they're working with, is nothing short of a miracle. That being said, it's worth mentioning that seeing the story through to the end will be a long haul. As in my case, it wasn't until the 35 hour mark that I got to the credits, and even then, I hadn't seen all that the main story had to throw at me, as I still had almost 35 more before I got to what the game calls the epilogue. This isn't a big deal for me personally, but if you're desperate to know what happens with the main story, you may find yourself waiting quite a while before you receive a solid resolution. I'm not sure how long exactly it'll take for the average gamer, as I don't know where my skill level or luck compares with everyone else, but I'd assume probably 10 hours of wiggle room on both ends. Even putting aside the fact that this is to be expected from a roguelike though, I'm also willing to accept it just because of how well presented everything is, from excellent artwork to really great voice acting. Whether it be Zeus, Poseidon, Athena, Dionysus, Hades, literally every voice and portrait in this game fits. And each voice actor plays so well to their personalities that I would go out of my way to avoid generic currency rewards just so I could hear more of their commentary. Sure, you have The Voice, who appears as a disembodied narrator that Zagreus can somehow hear, but while his voice is still welcome, it's ironically the voice of Zagreus that stands out the most, as his sarcastic wit provides a nice contrast to how serious or lackadaisical the other characters are. Here you go. It seems my princely duty to commission this fine portrait of myself. I ought to have named you Narcissus instead. And to further catch you by surprise, that's Darren Korb's voice. Which means not only does he have his work cut out for him in the music department, he also has to carry the backbone of the game's narrative, which he does a spectacular job at. And speaking of that music, I'll admit it didn't initially stand out at first. Not because it was bad, but because of how hectic the game is. Looking back on my footage, it's honestly dizzying how fast everything looks when you're not in direct control of it. With so much motion, dashing, particle effects everywhere, it's insane how much can be going on at once. Because of that, when you're playing it, you barely have time to appreciate the beautiful artwork or the good music or even your own thoughts sometimes. Even so, there were a couple of exceptions, such as the basic melody that plays when you first step out, some of the stingers that play before and after a boss fight, and a moment that needs no introduction or context. singing here come on in okay no could dash clear through that wall i think This is a good video game. I almost feel bad for showing this, as it's worth discovering stuff like this on your own, but to really demonstrate how well the game presents itself, I had to pick something. And in this case, it's not a moment that has a great deal of relevance to the central plot, but when it happened, it was a welcome surprise. At the time, I was halfway through a run with a weapon that I was unfamiliar with, and had just gone through a grueling fight on what Zagreus calls the Barge of Death. A claustrophobic area where you have to deal with a ton of explosives on top of these obnoxious crystals that were periodically giving enemies invulnerability. Going from that to suddenly hearing singing meant my surprise mirrored that of Zagreus, in what was a refreshing moment where I just let the song play itself out. As for the rest of the music, it's Supergiant doing what they do best. Though as good as it is, this is one of the few places where the structure of a modern roguelite doesn't quite work to their advantage. To give an example of why, take a look at Bastion's level design. With it, there are specific parts that are meant to be calmer as you explore the level, which means you have songs in the soundtrack that are tailored to matching whatever atmosphere they're aiming for, with the game switching between them depending on the circumstance. 
In this game, however, you don't have levels as much as you have sections. So instead of dynamically switching between tracks, it chooses to de-emphasize a lot of the instrumentation when you're in a menu or between battles. That then means for moments where you can actually breathe, a large number of them have little more than a single bass guitar playing a simple melody. Objectively, it's the right call to ensure that the music isn't distracting during those calmer moments, but I do subjectively find it less interesting for those cases. Even so, for all of the praise or criticism I can heap onto the story and presentation, it's the gameplay that really has to shine in order to be worth the effort. So let's take a look at it. To best explain the combat, let's begin with the first couple of runs you embark on. The game starts you out right as you're leaving with a sword, which has a basic 3-strike attack pattern and a ground slam. You can also throw a crystal out, which has to be retrieved in order to be used again, but does a substantial amount of damage and is pretty much your only ranged option when you start out. Apart from that, you have a short dash, which is your main way of not getting smacked in the face. As you continue, you'll notice different symbols on the doorways, which tell you the reward if you're able to complete the room. The reward may be some kind of currency, a blessing from a god that gives you a choice between one of three upgrades, a pomegranate that will upgrade one of the boons you already have, or maybe something special depending on which part of the underworld you're in. After going through a few rooms, however, you'll likely have taken a few hits, receiving a warning from Zagreus that you can't heal. Eventually, this means you meet your end likely before getting out of Tartarus and are thrown back home, which is where the progression system of modern roguelites kick in. Before you embark, you have a few choices to make based on what you manage to collect on your latest escape attempt. Whether it be shards of darkness that can be used to buff you directly from this mirror of darkness, different weapons which function radically different from each other, gems that modify what you find out in the underworld, or nectar that can be used to progress side stories and unlock a variety of trinkets, each of which gives some special benefit while it's equipped. The progression system in this game is fantastic as they keep enough upgrades accessible at once to where there's always something new to work toward. But even as you seemingly finish unlocking everything, suddenly another way to progress opens up. And that's before we talk about how the game encourages you to try out literally everything it has to offer. In one case, you get more shards of darkness if you use a certain weapon, and in another, you can unlock a list of prophecies from the fates, which basically says you will use everything from literally every upgrade system or bit of progression this game possesses, and we will reward you handsomely for doing so. It may seem overwhelming at first with all of the options available to you, and the UI can buckle a little when trying to show you all of them, but the game doles them out slowly enough to where it never becomes too overwhelming. To keep you coming back, as mentioned earlier, neither the game nor its story ends when you finally do make it through a run. So the moment you do succeed, suddenly they decide to give you all of these optional extra conditions through the Pact of Punishment, such as giving all enemies the ability to shrug off damage from the first hit or two, or increasing their damage, or decreasing your ability to heal, or giving boss fights some new tricks, or quadrupling the damage from stage hazards. Some of them are relatively easy to account for, but even in those cases, it can be surprising to discover what the game throws at you when they're applied. In the case of quadrupling damage from stage hazards, I was unaware that something in the final battle was considered a trap, which meant the one time it hit me, I was already below half health, and then before I knew it, back home with me, even after getting most of the way through that final fight. Because what's a roguelike if you aren't learning by dying to some novel threat? And for the really adventurous, there's an optional difficulty setting for a new game that will automatically and permanently apply a small number of these conditions right from the start. A fact which meant when I tried it out after completing the epilogue, I followed almost an identical completion pattern to the first time I spent with the game. To put it simply, I don't recommend starting out with this enabled, as it does not go easy on you. That being said, it can get a little grindy once you unlock the Pact of Punishment, which mostly come down to your rewards for doing so. The first time you clear an area with a specific weapon, you get various rewards which can be used to directly improve your weapons, modify the dungeon in some way, or can be used to progress a side story or unlock other power-ups. However, despite being able to re-earn these rewards by turning up the heat, the heat requirements only increment by one after a successful run. Which means early on, it's really easy to abuse the system by ramping up the difficulty on things that really can't do much to you. Oh no, a 20% increase in enemies for standard encounters that the shield can make short work of, whatever shall I do? Oh no, the first boss has some new tricks up her sleeve, how shall I overcome what's become a cakewalk at this point? 
To be fair, I say all of this despite the fact that when I tried to turn the heat meter up to 8 in order to fast track my way to whatever this is, both times I tried were dismal failures. In one case, I made the first three bosses more dangerous. And while the changes to the first two were simple enough to account for, the third one was such a ridiculous improvement that I refused to show it to you. I had warning of what was going to happen due to a mini-boss, but nothing can compare to just how hilarious it looked upon first entry. Combine that with how insane the fight was, especially since I had already been playing poorly in that run, and it made short work of me. I wish I had streamed that fight, because despite my ambitions being curtailed, I just could not stop laughing. And it was worth the price of admission just to see the third boss in that getup with those weapons in that circumstance, which I daren't say any more of because you need to play it for yourself to appreciate it properly. It is amazing. To compare these circumstances, I'm not sure how best to address the problem. On one hand, it is technically my fault for turning up the heat in such a way to where it was easy to abuse. On the other hand, I think the system could use some work to prevent me from abusing it in the first place. Perhaps if they made the heat gauge go up by increments of 2 when you're successful, so as to allow a distinction between things like, say, increasing the danger of the first boss fight, versus a flat 20% damage increase on all enemies. The former may be a novelty that could throw you off guard, but if you're able to consistently get to the final battle, you usually have enough leeway to make up for a sloppy fight. The flat damage increase, though, can absolutely make the difference between a success and failure, as that damage increase applies to literally everything, including the big scary battle at the end. To some extent, they do encourage you to deal with all of them eventually, thanks to the prophecies, but with this being a roguelike, it seemed like I was completing runs more often than I probably should have at that stage. Oh, and just as an aside, if you do go out of your way to hunt for prophecies, it's worth mentioning that the Codex can give you a lot of helpful information in that regard and was something that helped a lot in finding the remainder. Not only does it offer plenty of well-written information about pretty much everything, you can look at the blessings that a given god bestows, and in that section, it'll also tell you the prerequisites to get ones which are harder to reach. This then means you have a solid in-game solution on how to complete prophecies that doesn't require you to go wiki hunting. Which, for the sake of the story and all the little things tacked onto the gameplay, you should actively avoid. Regardless of all of that, if the core gameplay weren't anything to write home about, this would be a lot of fluff around a lot of nothing. Luckily, when you finally step out there and are face to face with the denizens of the underworld, the game is firing on all cylinders, with some of the best combat I've seen from not just a roguelike, but action RPGs in general. Every weapon in this game right from the word go has its use, with the sword being a good all-around choice, the bow relying on sniping from afar with a nice spread fire in case the enemy gets too close, the spear offering a good mid-range option, the shield that basically lets you roleplay as Captain America, the gauntlets which can dish out damage ridiculously fast at close range, and even this weird minigun thing that also has a built-in artillery shot. The sound design and visuals from all of them are so satisfying, as there is not a single weapon here that doesn't sound great when it's either fired or finds its mark. Add on to that really responsive controls, and the only reason you're doing poorly is because you're just not playing well. Assuming you don't get screwed on your upgrades anyway. And there is a risk of that with this game featuring roguelike elements. But what surprises me is that there are very few, if any, upgrades that are objectively bad. Before I get too far though, the upgrades you get as you go from room to room can be counterproductive to ones you already have. For instance, the mirror where you redeem your shards of darkness gives you one of two choices for each of these lines, with two of my favorite being right here. These two increase the number of times I can use my cast, and substantially increase the damage I deal to enemies who have one or more of them embedded in their nervous system. However, there's a blessing from Hermes that reduces how long the crystal is embedded in an enemy, which might not be a problem if I'm using a melee weapon or want to use my cast for direct damage, but if I'm using a ranged weapon and want to more than double my damage on a single target, I want the crystal stuck in an enemy for as long as possible. Even then, however, there are some upgrades that can synergize with this, such as a blessing from Artemis that will deal damage when a crystal leaves a target, and a dual blessing from Artemis and Zeus that will cause lightning to strike enemies near a crystal that's on the field instead of ready to fire. To go back to the negative, there may not be an objectively bad upgrade, but there are some upgrades that are usually worse than others. For instance, a blessing from Ares will leave behind what the game calls a blade rift whenever you dash, which will deal a substantial amount of damage to enemies next to or on top of it. However, you also have a similar power from Dionysus, where, instead of leaving behind the Blade Rift, you leave behind three pulses that inflict damage over time. The former is good if your enemy is staying put, but because of how fast-paced the game is, the power from Dionysus is usually more reliable, even if you often get more damage from Ares against a static target. 
In fact, that fast-paced nature can be a problem for some of the weapons and upgrades, as the bow especially is one that's more of a patience game with carefully aimed shots. This is made even worse by the fact that it's the first weapon you unlock, immediately after you've had to be really nimble with the sword. So going from a really fast-paced fighting style where you have to carefully dodge attacks to something which feels sluggish by comparison, and you've got a weapon which, if the steam forms are any indication, isn't the most popular one. There are also some upgrades that you really only want one of at a time, such as with Aphrodite's weak debuff. Every time you hit someone with a move that's been buffed by her, the target will deal less damage. But since that damage reduction can only be applied once, it's something you'll likely put on one of your slower attacks, or maybe if you're consistently close quarters, you'll put it on your dash or cast. After that point though, getting a blessing from Aphrodite can be a liability, as you would normally prefer to layer a different kind of effect on your main source of damage instead of giving you another option to apply the debuff. Because of these differences with the weapons and upgrades, I did have runs where my goal was less to win and more to experiment, some of which worked out really well, others which hamstrung me before I could even get within striking distance of the final fight. Perhaps the most variable in that regard are the Daedalus upgrades, as pretty much everything you receive from one of his hammers will either significantly buff your weapon or fundamentally change how you use it. Sometimes this can work to your advantage, as it did with my first successful run. In it, I got one for the bow that took away the need to wait before firing it at max range, which may have meant I lost the built-in extra damage if you timed the release right, but also meant I could spam it. This also ended up working really well for my other upgrades, as a blessing from Aphrodite to my main attack greatly increased its damage while applying the weak debuff, and a blessing from Artemis meant I got an extra seeking arrow every time I hit someone with it. All of that plus the distance I could maintain between my enemies meant I was able to get through the final battle for the first time, albeit by the skin of my teeth, after 24 runs in total, and after being beaten into the dirt by that fight three times before then. However, this can also work against you, as one time when I brought out the minigun, I went out of my way to fulfill prophecies rather than go for what made sense strategically. The first upgrade I got drastically increased the artillery round's damage, but meant it would damage me if I stood in it, which meant I couldn't leverage a buff I had enabled before leaving. I considered it a fair trade-off at the time, because who doesn't like being able to nuke half a room, but then we come to the second Daedalus hammer I found. This one cut my range and ammo in half in exchange for an AoE blast, which meant once I was forced into a narrower space, I couldn't deal enough damage from a safe distance and ended up getting killed within a few chambers of the final battle. Also, regardless of what you find out there, beware the anvil you can get from Karen's shop, as it'll swap out one of your Daedalus upgrades for two random ones, which can technically help you, but also force you to play incredibly different to what you had prearranged. Whoever at Supergiant thought this was a good idea is either a mad genius or a sadist, and I'm not sure which is worse given that the Codex demands I buy it a few times to fill out its entry. Even so, while there is some variance based on what you unlock and how well it works with your current setup, occasions where a run is completely torpedoed by a single bad upgrade are a rarity, with the one I just detailed being one of maybe two or three cases where that happened, even after taking gambles with the Anvil. There's enough viable options to where, as I got more permanent upgrades and spent more time with the game, I was able to consistently get to the later stages without dying. A large part of that is because, for all the randomness and uncertainty that can be present in a run, there's also a tremendous degree to which skill factors into your success. Though you can certainly get the impression of this game being very button mashy just by taking a random sampling from my footage, you don't always have that luxury. For standard encounters you can sometimes get away with it, as there's usually enough enemies to where it's a matter of putting out as much damage as fast as possible, but when bosses show up, that habit can and will get you killed. Hell, that first successful run with the bow only happened because I told myself constantly to calm the hell down, to not spam dash, to play the patience game instead of getting mauled through sloppy timing. And I had good reason to tell myself that, because my previous run had ended at the final battle for that very reason. I got complacent with an awesome setup for the sword, didn't time my dashes with the enemy strikes, and got tilted to such a degree that I got stomped into the ground even worse than the first time I got that far. This despite the build I had for that run being technically better than the one that made it through. With all of that said, there's only so far anecdotal evidence can carry an argument, so here are some of the things the game does to prevent you from getting too comfortable with button mashing. First, every enemy has a discrete attack pattern, and all of them telegraph it in some way. This then means thanks to your dash offering you brief invulnerability, dodging attacks becomes a matter of timing rather than luck. There are exceptions to this, as with enough enemies or, more accurately, enough projectiles being thrown everywhere, it can be hard to avoid everything being thrown out. But this seldom shows up before the first boss fight, and by then you usually have a way to circumvent it, or have enough of a buffer to where you can take the hit in the moment. 
This is also why the condition that increases enemy move speed and attack speed increases the heat gauge by 3 instead of 1, as reducing your window of opportunity to avoid attacks can make a major difference. Second, to tie into the exception I just mentioned, you almost always have enough options with which to bolster the strength of your current weapon or to somehow make up for its weakness. You can't completely take away probability, but thanks to the upgrades you have back home, there's always just enough breathing room to where you can get past a bad encounter so long as you're careful. And that's before mentioning how traps in tight spaces aren't necessarily a detriment to you. If you set off a trap but have an enemy between you and the source of that trap, they'll be the ones hit. And if you have a way to push them around, you can force them into those traps directly. You can also use the same method to knock them into walls, which will do extra damage to them. So even if your specific weapon is lacking in damage, sometimes all you need to do is just literally back them against the wall and let the impact finish them off. Third, one of your Mirror of Darkness upgrades and a fair number of upgrades you get in the field cause you to deal more damage when you hit an enemy from behind, a condition the game calls Backstab. It's not something you can always take advantage of, but it, more so than anything else, encourages you to be aware of your position. It's one thing to mindlessly dash around an enemy until they're dead, but being able to do that and lay into them with added damage isn't necessarily doable, so it becomes an active trade-off depending on the enemy and circumstance. In fact, some enemies will be armed with shields that will prevent you from damaging them unless you hit them in the back or lob AoE projectiles in their general direction. So unless you want to take the slow and lazy route, it's something you'll need to learn how to do eventually. Finally, as mentioned earlier, the controls are pitch perfect, with there never being a point where Zagreus didn't respond with exactly the command I gave him. Note that I didn't say I gave him a good command, as I would sometimes mix up the cast and special, but the game runs incredibly well, and the hitboxes on you, your weapons, and your enemies perfectly reflect what's being shown on the screen. It's a basic thing to bring up perhaps, but when healing is extremely limited, every little bit matters, and every time I took a hit, it was always my fault. Even for that filthy bone hydra where I got greedy and tried to recover my cast, which meant I took one hit from him and a final hit from a stray projectile that wouldn't have mattered had I played it safe. However, there's an important question that must be asked if you're playing this on PC. Is it playable with keyboard and mouse? The reason this needs to be asked is because when the game notices you have a controller plugged in, but are using keyboard and mouse, it'll tell you down here that a controller is recommended. So clearly that's the superior way to play, right? Well, I see why they would say that, as you have significant trade-offs between the two control schemes. A controller is able to be more precise with respect to movement, and given how much you need to dodge around, that can be really valuable to have at your disposal. It's also important in order to take advantage of backstab, and since the game is using a top-down camera, it's easy enough to handle both movement and aiming from the left analog. With keyboard and mouse, however, they opted to use WASDA for movement, and by default, your dash's direction is pointed in the direction of your movement controls instead of your cursor, meaning your dash can only move in eight directions relative to the screen. That being said, using a keyboard and mouse like this means that your ability to aim and your ability to move are kept completely separate, which makes it a hell of a lot easier to aim, especially for AoE attacks, which the controller's aim assist can do okay with, but if you hit the left analog at any point while aiming it, the direction can be thrown off a lot. With a mouse though, you point, you click, and you're back to dashing like a madman to avoid all the attacks aimed at your face. Because of that, I would consider them about evenly matched when it comes to viability, so which one you pick will come down to personal preference. For me, that preference was for keyboard and mouse, because after spending literal thousands of hours in games like Torchlight and League of Legends, this kind of mouse aiming is second nature to me, which meant the only adjustment I had to make was for the combat's faster pace, and the fact that the game uses WASDA for movement, which, given that I played Bastion and Transistor with keyboard and mouse as well, weren't that difficult to adjust to. Overall, Hades is easily the game I've had the most fun with this year. It plays to everything that Supergiant has done well in the past, with visceral combat, excellent storytelling, great visuals, and memorable music, alongside one of, if not the best progression systems I've seen from any game with roguelike elements. Pretty much everything negative I can say about it boils down to outliers and nitpicks, be it the rare case where I didn't get good upgrades, my own choice to avoid the really dangerous modifiers making it a little too easy after a while, or the fact that the faster paced combat makes the bow a more challenging weapon than may have been intended. Even then though, these are just that, outliers and nitpicks, all of which are easy to overlook because of just how fun and variable the core gameplay is. Looking at all of this, I honestly kind of feel bad for Supergiant, because I have no idea how they're going to top this. But in the here and now, they deserve every bit of success they've received from this game, and I can't wait to see what they have in store for us next. If you're interested, you can find it on PC and the Nintendo Switch. 
To that end, I did buy the Switch version in case I ever wish to travel or play it on my TV, but just as a fair warning, there is a difference in performance between my desktop and Switch. In handheld mode, it plays virtually identically to my PC. In both modes, however, the loading time is a little longer, as you would expect since I'm using an SSD on my PC, and in docked mode, I did encounter some strange performance issues. The first time I ever tried to run it, there was a weird case where everything played normally, but the sound effects were half a second behind. Said issue didn't appear again the second time I played it docked, but as you can probably tell from this video, it's not nearly as crisp. There are individual frames, such as when you're overlooking Tartarus, where you would barely know the difference, so my guess is that when the performance starts to wane, it backs off on the anti-aliasing or knocks the resolution down. It's still playable, but if you intend to primarily play it at home, you're likely better off with the PC version. With that said, that's all I have for this video. Thank you all for watching. Please like and share this if you find it deserving, and subscribe to this channel for more reviews as well as other content posted on a semi-regular basis. On that note, this will be the last video of the year, as I've got the usual plans to visit family over the holidays, and if my laptop can't play this game, you know it won't be able to handle my video editing software. That is, unless I want to commandeer my father's PC for a bit, but why worry about that when there's more important things to do while I'm there, like, I don't know, the visiting family part? As for what the new year will bring, it's gonna be a busy one for this channel. What with all the upcoming games I'm looking forward to, an ongoing review series that's gonna take quite some time to complete, and plenty of games in my backlog that keep being neglected. Here's to a great new year, and until then, thank you once again for watching, let me know what you think in the comments below, and I'll see you all later.